uh, coffee, drinks, uh, something to eat. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Anne Mai. I'm a professor of Nordic literature, and um, um, I'm very engaged with a research project called Uses of Literature, where we are so lucky that uh, Professor Peter Felsky um, is uh, our name's four professor, and she's here for five years, half of the year. And um, we, we started the project uh, it was last year, and uh, we were so lucky that one of my very dear colleagues, uh, Moritz Schramm, uh, Associate Professor Moritz Schramm, agreed to join our project and uh, to take part in the development of uses of literature. And this is a great advantage for us, uh, because he is a specialist uh, in um, uh, German literature, for a number of years he has worked with one of our major concepts, the concept of recognition. What does <coughs> recognition mean in lit literary studies? The recognition of the readers, um, uh, their way of using uh, literary works. And he has uh, written a number of excellent uh, uh, journal articles, also monographs on German literature and comparison, uh, also into comparison literature. Uh, so it was such a great pleasure uh, for us that he would participate in uh, our project and he, uh, he has already contributed. Um, he is uh, the, he's one of the leaders of a major research project on post-migration uh, financed by the National Research uh, Council, uh, the Free National Research Council of Denmark, and uh, it's such an interesting uh, project on post-migration. And of course, uh, this is also very important to us in uses of literature, the sub uh, this uh, topic of the post-migration. And um, yeah, I'm happy that he's here, and uh, I hope that you give him a warm welcome. Yeah, thank you, introduction, uh, <coughs> Anne Marie. And of course, it's my pleasure to be part of the group that you want me in the group today <coughs> from the users of literature. As Anne Marie was saying, I will today not, not so much speak about nice recognition or users of literature. <coughs> Would be happy to discuss all those things afterwards. But I will mainly focus on on the other project that Anne Marie uh, mentioned, uh, post migration stuff. And just to give you a brief idea, what you know about the setting. We got funded in 2016 for, what I'm saying now? I think we have three years, isn't it? Yeah, 16, 17, 18, that's it. So we're kind of approaching as a, as a research group. Uh, this, we have <coughs> the second half of, of our funding period. We are writing currently a monograph, um, co authored monograph with seven, seven writers together in one book, uh, you know, writing on every single thing together, which is quite a funny project, quite difficult. But the whole thing is about post-migration and, and the arts culture. The group consists of, uh, besides me, seven other researchers, which come from different universities in, Com in Denmark, and, um, and from different fields inside of the humanities. That means we have people from art history, we have people from literature studies, and, and so on, you know, like kind of a broad field. And I have the pleasure to be the one who's kind of trying to keep the group together. Always kind of difficult stuff. Um, that's great. And so what I'm trying to do today is to talk a little bit about the concept of post-migration. Uh, some actually inside the research field reject the term post-migration. <coughs> they insist on talking about post-migrant perspectives. Uh, I do a little bit both of it and you know there are a lot of discussions which I would not take today, but again in the discussion. Okay. Sorry, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. What's the main difference with post-migration and post-migrant? I'll come back to it. I, I mean, just a simple thing. I'll not go into all the detailed discussion inside of the field. But I, I apologize for my ignorance. Yeah. But the main thing is that people would say post, okay, kind of, of course, it's a temporal di division. I mean, a temporal yeah. distinction, of course, uh, something after. Yeah. But also, it kind of keeps it, it you know, there's, there's some kind of distance to the term before in a post term. And, and post-migration, would people say, do you lay distance to migration as such? Yes, yes. And of course we don't, um, as a research group. Post-migrant would mean that this distance would go to the label of the migrant, <coughs> that's right identity. But I'll come a little bit back to it later, maybe a little bit, otherwise you'll ask again. If you can, if you can some time for that. 
Um, so let's start with an interview. In an early interview this year, um, and I quote a little bit from this interview, the political scientist Naika Fogutan, who is professor at Humboldt University in Berlin, uh, she was, when, when she was interviewed in a newspaper in Germany, she was uh, complimented with the Siegeszug, the triumph march of the post migrant society, the term post migrant society. The concept of post migrant society, which is the foundation of your scientific work, the interviewer starts out, has had a rapid rise, blitz career. Many, he continues, are hoping that finally a term has been found which describes, adequately describes a society and provides a good basis for visionary outlines for the future. So the whole thing about here is that, that people would say this is a term we're discussing now in Germany, this is a new term, post migrant society here, yet another term, uh, to open up discussions about where we are today in society. And of course, Nadia Fogutan, when she's uh, kind of confronted with the compliments, she's the one labeling this term of the post migrant society, he would reject those compliments and kind of put them further to Shami Langhoff. Let's give you a brief picture. I don't have many slides, so it's not, well, I have many slides. I don't use many slides, so I'll leave a few of them. Um, <clears throat> but she, she kind of referred back to Shami Langhoff and said, well, the congratulations, um, Leica Fogutan answers, must go to Shami Langhoff, who has introduced the concept in, the artistic, in her artistic work as a subversive, ironic counter-concept in order to make clear that Germany, it's our German context we're talking about, does not consist of the groups migrants and non-migrants, but of many different groups of persons supporting each other or positioning each other in opposition to one, one another. And here again we're coming about this, I mean, the discussion about what is post-migration, post-migrant. Here it's about the <coughs> protection of the label as a migrant in the public discourse somehow as part. But um, Nadia Fortan here referring to Shami Langhoff um, is kind of referring back to the artistic background of the term. It's coming from, from the art and cultural scene in Berlin where people started to use the label of post-migrant stuff, post-migrant theater as a self-labeling uh, function in their own work. Um, and Nadia Fortan then continued the interview <coughs> that she and her colleagues just have transferred the concept to social sciences and try to operationalize it. A process was challenging, she said. The arts, I quote a little bit more from the interview, the arts and cultural scene can use a concept without defining, defining it in detail. But we as researchers must define our concepts, fix them, build models. In this process of appropriation, there always is a risk, Fortan continues, that's part, that parts of this subversive force get lost. On the other side, there could be the possibility to use the concept productively in scientific research by working with it and accepting the complexity and ambiguity included in the term. So what, what's about here is that Nika Fortan that kind of put the congratulations back to the art scene, the same moment saying we have a problem here, a challenge, when we try to transfer, you know, not defined subversive concept from the art scene back into academic scientific work. And this is what <coughs> then happens in the next 10, 15 years. We're talking about last 10, 15 years where the whole concept kind of involved in, in at least in German context, where people in academic world try to define the term, try to use the term, and struggling with, at the same time, with the kind of the opening to the art scene, the cultural scene, which kind of use it as a subversive critical concept. And how do those things come together? Of course, I would argue that the whole concept here, I mean, this kind of interrelations, interchange between art and culture and academic world, of course, is productive. And I think it kind of helps us to, to kind of go back to, to what we're talking about somehow. And what I want to do today, uh, kind of following up on this, is two things. I will first look back into the background of the term, <coughs> how it emerged in the first place, where it comes from in the art and cultural scene, give you some you know, broad ideas. Of course, time is limited, but you know, give some ideas of the background. And then in the second step, I will discuss if and possibly how the concept can, can offer new perspectives influencing our way of looking <coughs> at issues like migration, immigration, integration in social and cultural research. I mean, how can we use this kind of concept? 
obviously, when I ask if we can use the term, I would not be here if I would not believe we can, you know, obviously. Um, and when I <coughs> talked about the, the, you know, the headline of my the title of my lecture, I created a question mark. It disappeared on the posters. I think it's actually fine because, of course, I think there's a new perspective in including those kind of things. And that's what I want to talk about. But let me just go back and talk a little bit, some minutes, about the historical background, where it comes from. Um, the concept from post migration actually shows up to kind of open a little bit up for complexity <coughs> here, shows up in scientific academic works in the 90s. Baumann, Sunier, Triesmann, and others are using the concept in the 90s, but it somehow didn't make any impact. You can see, in, especially in, in social sciences, you can still today see articles using the word of the post immigration generation, anything, referring obviously to people who are not migrated themselves, but would be descendants. Uh, second, third generation immigrants. That's, this use has been around and is around. But what we're talking about here is a different kind of concept <laughs> conceptualization. And that started when Shemin Langhoff, still have her here, put the term on the agenda in the beginning of the 21st century, some years ago. <coughs> she introduced the concept already during the festival Europe in Motion in 2004. Um, she comes, Shemin Langhoff comes from, from film, literary, field, whatever. And she was working in a publishing house a little bit. Then she started to work with Fatin Akin. Some of you may know uh, the films of Fatin Akin. She started as a production assistant uh, there in, in uh, Head On, Gegen die Wand, which won the Berlinale and so on. But she was involved in different fields and then turned to the theater. And in 2004, the first festival she organized, Europe in Motion, was very much about movies and films still in, in the Berlin setting here. Inviting young people. Uh, <coughs> combining art production, sound production, and, and modern video installation and movies, actually, and film productions in Europe in motion, in motion. At this first festival, Europe in Motion, they already started to talk about the concept of post migration or post migrant art. In 2006, and I'll make this kind of background story a bit short here, another festival, Beyond Belonging, influential in Berlin art scene, they kind of get together a lot of people from different art circles and, and again at a big theater in Berlin and started to, to kind of discuss those things. In 2008, and that's the main, that's the one, the belonging thing here from 2006, the major, major breakthrough was the Ballhaus Nordinstrasse, which was a very small independent theater. Nobody knew it before in the, uh, you know, in the multicultural area you would normally call it, um, Berlin Kreuzberg, a lot of descendants from guest workers living there, a lot of students, you know, this kind of areas, but in quite a many of you may have been there. And in 2008, Shami Langhoff, together with some others, and Celia, Tom Shaikongolu, and as I said, took over, so to speak, the Ballhaus and Nienstraße, they made a deal with the local authorities, and started their own theater. They started the theater under the label of the post migrant theater, and this label, she later in interviews explained it as a kind of self-labeling, I mean, everybody puts labels on us, she said, we would be the migrants, we would be the ones making migrant theater, so why don't we invent our own labels and call it post-migrant theater? A bit provocative, again, because everybody was saying, you're making migrants, <coughs> you know, because you're descendants from migrants. I mean, Kevin Langhoff was born in Turkey, and a lot of the people, not everybody, but a lot of the people around this uh, bylaws, of course, there would be, and would have, you know, different backgrounds, quite a couple of them would have backgrounds in Turkey, Italy, Russia, and whatever. <clears throat> so, the, so what they did, they overtook the theater to some late, gave it the label post migrant theater, and just very, very shortly after, in the next two or three years, it was a huge success. success. First in Berlin, like everybody started to talk about this small independent theater that was sold out all the time. Obviously, like it often is, in the beginning, there was the local people going there. After one or two years, all the academics, teachers from schools would go there because there's something happening here, you know, something interesting. High quality um, theater, um, challenging, innovative, and, and very successful. The label helped. <coughs> the help was part of the kind of getting out and saying, we are doing something new. We are not doing migrant literature. We are not doing migrant theater. We are post-migrant. Nobody really knows what they meant, but it was new. And, <laughs> and what helped. And until today, and when, when I kind of meet with researchers in the field, academics talking, using the term, all the discussions coming up, nobody knows exactly what we want to Say with German, it's not true, of course, a lot of the definitions. But just opening the discussion by getting the distance to the old use of terms like migrant and other things, 
extremely productive. I mean, we're always coming back to say, like, well, if we don't kind of keep on using the old terminology, if we want to use new terminology, post migration then we have to reframe the things, and we have to rediscuss the things. So, yeah, I've been in this field for quite some years in the kind of academic world, and those discussions are the most interesting discussions I've ever seen. I mean, it's really getting always to the point here. However, <coughs> they had success, huge success, and um, Matt Blatt and other pieces, I think maybe have some posters, you know, this kind of, you know, this kind of avant-garde theater somehow, and a high quality, it's not kind of, you know, it's professional, very mixed ensemble, um, obviously, and, you know, mixing all the gender issues and everything into it, you can imagine those kind of theater. And I'm, I have some trailers, but I will not show them now, I can make them find some later. What's happened then, just to kind of go on in this kind of very simple background story, is that, uh, well, actually, the local governments in Berlin were not really aware of the success. It was a huge success, but they kind of didn't react on it. So Sherman and I have gone away to Vienna, where she got promised a big kind of position in a big theater. And, and when this kind of get public, that she was on her way to leave Berlin, there was a huge outcry in the cultural scene. So how can we, as a city, as Berlin city, kind of not react on this? How can it be that <coughs> she's leaving the city, who's one of the most innovative person and having huge success in the city? So suddenly the local government kind of redecided and offered her actually the smallest, but still one of the state-funded theaters. This is independent theater. The next one she took over in 2012 is the Gorky Theater. Maxim Gorky Theater in the center of Berlin, uh, Unter den Linden. As I said, state-founded, not independent, a stable ensemble, and some millions of euros. <coughs> you know, it's a different, this is a different setting. Now she's up in the, in the, in the mainstream, so to speak. Um, and the story continues. The Maxim Gorky Theater, just after she took over, together with Jens Hildje, She's always joking, the Turk and the, and the gay, you know, it's really a gay, and she's a kind of Turkish background, so they too kind of getting the thing up. But the Maxim Gorky theater is today maybe the most discussed theater in whole Berlin, maybe whole Germany. Just some couple of years after she, she took over, they, the first thing she did, I think it's a good anecdote, a lot of people do this when they <coughs> overtake theaters, I mean, when they get kind of director position. But what she did was kind of firing 60, 70% of the stuff. You know, so it's, it's not like we're coming and everything is nice, you know, showing people out because she wants her own people in. And her own people, of course, actively, you can imagine people of color, different backgrounds, said, well, where are those people in the theater scene? There's nobody. So we have to gate them. We have to build our own institutions, which I did in Kreuzberg, and now we overtake the mainstream institution. That was the thing. And to overtake the mainstream institutions, of course, we have to get rid of the old traditions, so to speak. Uh, so this is kind of, this is part of from the beginning, and so the same thing. And <clears throat> <coughs> Just to give you an idea of what they kind of come from when they started the whole thing. What they were saying was, in the beginning, obviously, and I think you can imagine this point, that they say, they say there was voices lacking. That's a classical story of lack of representation. And they were saying 60 years after the beginning of the so-called last worker immigration to Germany, that's again a quotation from Jeremy Langhoff, Langhoff says, my protagonist have finally got access to the theater world so they can tell their own stories and other stories from their own perspectives. Stories of migration experiences were either completely neglected or told from a privileged majority perspective. We were simply lacking text stories from Chaikogolu remembers, stories that haven't been told on stage yet, and obviously not from the perspective they want. So this is kind of the old story. You know the story about representation struggles to get in and change those things. And this is very much about institutionalization. I mean, building up institutions, as I said before. Uh, <clears throat> when they start the festivals, you have been motion and beyond belonging. So quite fast understood that these festivals are nice and interesting, but we have to go into the institutions. We have to institutionalize those things. We have to get out of the shadow of the dominant cultural discourse and add translocal <coughs> perspectives, which are not self-evident yet, to the privileged institutions. There was, of course, this critical political dimension in it. As political activist, Tunshay Kavogolu remembers, as political activist, we consider, we consciously turn to the art as means to mobilize people. 
This is how I began. If you want to change the world, then you take art as means, as a means and medium for doing this. You don't found a political party. I think one could disagree on this, but that's kind of the ambition they come from. Interesting for the things I'm <clears throat> going over now to the academic discussions here in a second, obviously is that the intention those people had from the very be beginning was to break the minority discourse, as I called it. So this was not about identity politics, um, at least not in the first place. Of course, there's always a level of identity <coughs> politics in it. You can still remember when they overtook the Bayer Ostern in 2008. Of course, this is not longer a suitable position that the minority remains a minority. Minority. We have to get a step further. The whole country must, he continues, be rearranged and changed. The identity, as it is collectively framed and negotiated, must be changed so that the future becomes different, more open than it was in the 90s. So this is an important little point, but it's an important point for me, that of course ambition was not like we making our own minority identity politics here, but we are going into the institutions to change the whole concept of what Germany is, so to speak. And this is ambitious, of course, <coughs> but I would even argue it somehow worked out so far. Um, of course, <laughs> not the whole way, and of course they're part of the, the you know, broad movement and whatever. But I, I didn't have a picture now, but just recently you could see that the Ministry of Family, Family Ministry in Germany, put a, you know, a new agenda on their website, saying in a post-market society we have to open for participation and everything. So like we managed and make a photon is very, very good in, in uh, you know, in labeling, you know, uh, what's, what's called um, you know, influence in, on political level. So they're trying to get on the federal government level to get those sort of things implemented now. That's interesting what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're quite tough. When, we, when I still keep on the historical background just for a second, <coughs> very briefly, obviously it doesn't come from, from nothing, that kind of attempt to overtalk the here. In the 90s in Germany, we have seen quite strong networking groups who kind of rejected, it was, of course, like everywhere in Europe, upcoming nationalism, xenophobia in the beginning of the 90s in Germany. I don't know whether you remember, but there was quite, quite heavy things going on, refugees from Yugoslavia coming and, and you know, struggles there. And so in the middle of 90s, as a reaction against it, there would be network groups founded would kind of reject, <coughs> would kind of fight, the agenda was to fight racism, simply. And one of the most influential movements, networks, was Kanaka Tak. The interesting thing with Kanaka Tak movement <coughs> is the one thing that most of the researchers I'm working today in our days coming from the Kanaka Tak movement when they were young. They kind of become professor later, and they're kind of following up on the agenda. There's a direct line from activist, artistic levels to academic world. It's an interesting line to follow how it, you know, one could even talk about um, Oh, the network theory and everything here. But um, <clears throat> the interesting thing was Kanaka Tak movement is they were influential at that time, of course, on a kind of avant-garde level. But they rejected, they were very aggressive in saying when we want to reject racism and kind of classical nationalistic xenophobia, then we have to challenge the whole concept of the foreigner, the migrant, and multiculturalism and everything. The term multiculturalism, which is quite, I know, it's of course, still around in the <coughs> English-speaking world, has been completely rejected from the German leftist activists in the 80s and 90s. Um, and there's not a discussion what's going on here. But obviously, those people in the Kanaka Tak movement, they wrote manifests and things were saying, of course, we will reject multicultural politics. We reject a dialogue between cultures. We, elect, we reject every form of tolerance towards a foreigner. Um, and so on and so on. And why would they do that? I'm simply enough, you can imagine, because the dialogue between culture, you know, has the idea behind that there would be two cultures that can go dialogue with each other. And obviously, when you want to be tolerant to the foreigners, then you reproduce the concept that the foreigner is not kind of part of you, so to speak, of the society. This is quite simple, but it was in the 90s innovative and somehow shocking, at least for some people. And they were aggressive, those people. I mean, in a good way. Aggressive, I just mean like, that was not talking. You know, that was like, we don't want you to label me as anything. You know, it was really kind of empowerment politics, and they, they kind of you know, went quite far. Um, <clears throat> Kanaka Tak is anti nationalist, right, anti racist, and rejects every single form for identity politics. Um, Kanaka Tak is not interested in questions about your passport or heritage. In fact, it challenges such questions in the first place. So it's not about where you come from, it's about with which attitude, which position you have in the world. Um, again, this may be kind of 
understanding for everybody here in the 90s that was kind of an attempt to counter argue the idea of a tolerant, nice, multicultural politics accepting the other as the other. And they kind of took another step and saying we don't want to be accepted as the other because we are no other. At least we want to talk about the processes of otherwise, how you kind of present us as the other and everything, which is a different set. So the whole thing is now how do, do we come from here, from Kanaka Tak, who then directly influenced the <coughs> academic circles and the post migrant field today, working on this field today, influencing the German government on their agenda. Oh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, right, I mean, right. it's, uh, it's a very interesting concept, right? I totally agree that it's nice to eliminate any kind of reference to the difference. But I've lived in the States for about eight years, and every time I had to do a tax return, I had to do a tax return called non-resident alien. Yeah, <laughs> so it. that probably goes exactly against the Nakatak uh, principles, right? You will never have to eventually write the tax return with the non-resident alien on it. I mean, one of the After first pieces, in the one of the first pieces they made in Balos Nonilstrasse, Schwarze Jungfrauen, Black Virgins, <coughs> were kind of showing Muslim women monologues kind of strip off, no wheel, nothing, just naked, you know, and it is showed like this, making monologues on, on their fundamentalistic view on society and everything, of course, very ironic, very aggressive. The whole thing was played with, you know, all what, what's called the encounter five things, the Spielberg movie, what's yeah. called the encounter of whatever, you know? Yeah. So this is a kind of the melody going through. And this melody, I come back to your, your yeah, point. But how far more in Germany this actually moment had such an impact? I mean, I can see Germany is pretty advanced. Really. No, I mean, it's not, it's not really the point of our Germany. The point is those people try to change Germany. I, don't, I would not say they have quite, quite succeeded yet, okay. but they have influence. What I'm trying to say here is what they use as the first thing is a melody from Spielberg's movie of the encounter of the fifth grade or whatever it's yeah, called, exactly. you know, saying like now you're coming in encounter with the aliens. So like um, so the terminology that we are the aliens who you have to find and we are the ones saving you was part of the whole ironic avant-garde theater here, and, and obviously the whole thing is, the whole thing is <coughs> of course ambivalent, of course it's clear. I mean you cannot break representation, lack of representation when you don't have a concept of identity politics. And, and obviously when you want to change the thing you have to find some point of identity politics. On the other hand identity politics are very close connected to abstract identity labels where, when you always kind of put into this box. And so what I, what I want to do now is, is actually to go a little bit into academic discussions about those things. Because the, as I started out with Nelika Fogotan's um, interview, she said, well, the art scene is kind of, they have the advantage that they don't have to define their concepts. They can just play with it, you know, <coughs> and they do. They provoke, they play. What do we do as scientists with it? And it's actually those discussions that you're kind of raising, like, well, what, is kind of, what kind of distinctions are we dealing with? That's then the question of how do we do this in scientists? How does it influence our view on those issues we are talking about? How can we, can we, again, I say we can, but it's a question, can we, can we reinvent migration research, migrant, migration studies as such? Uh, because obviously there are methodological questions showing up here which are not easy to answer, I would say. Um, <clears throat> so just very briefly to the academic reception, and now come to the second point here. Um, <clears throat> The first academic reception is quite fast, and when I talk about reception, I mentioned that in the 90s, the concept of migration already showed up in some articles and whatever I say. That's not the point. What I'm talking about here is that researchers are, are directly influenced by the theater concept we're talking about here and using the concept in their own work. And one of the first ones is Nelika Fogotan, you already met her, Evel Ildis from Professor in Salzburg, Fogotan Professor at Humboldt University. They began to use the concept like in 2010 it started, like two, two years after the big success of Wallace um, Nonienstraße. And, and the first thing they did, so they said like, well, the post migrant thing is very much about empowerment, about maybe even identity politics. It's about the post migrants who have not migrated themselves. That was the first reading in academic world. Um, I have a lot of quotations, I think I stopped them, I mean, I, I would kind of skip them, but uh, but the thing they were doing, of course, was that we have to accept the multiple, you know, the multiple belonging discussions, and we have to accept that people not belong in one place, and we have to accept ambiguities, we have to accept ambivalences, and we have to, you know, we have to stop the ascribed labels to telling people who have been growing up in this country in the third generation that they don't belong by calling them foreigners, which was common in Germany. I mean, I guess you, most of you know this big story here, guest worker migration, which is part of German history. 
Denmark would be the same, that like for 50 years or whatever it is, uh, you know, one keep on talking about those people as guests from both sides, so to speak. I mean, there was no integration politics until the end of the 90s in Germany. So whenever you kind of compare what people do with the refugee crisis today with guest worker immigration problems, integration problems, sorry, integration problems um, showing up, which they are problems, of course, you control them. Um, obviously, you mix up things because there was no integration politics. There was no language process, nothing. There were guests, they were leaving again. And so the children and grandchildren would be called foreigners when I was young in Germany, even though they were born in the country. That was kind of commonly accepted language at the time. Of course, this is what they're up against, obviously. I mean, just one, one, one comment more, I'm going away from my things, but, but still, one, one more comment. If somebody followed the German election thing, it was interesting that when Angela Merkel was asked about the refugee situation, and the first thing she would say, you know, I'm not talking about what she's doing, that's a different story, but saying she would, she would say, like, we have to remember they're all human beings. That's kind of Angela Merkel, you know, human, humanity, while she's looking at every border and you know, closing every border and everything. That's a different story afterwards now. But, but the next sentence interesting, she said in the television interview, she said, well, the main thing we have to remember with the refugee crisis at the moment, mm -hmm. crisis, whatever, refugee situation, is that we do not do the same mistakes again that we did with guest worker generations. So she really put the table, you know, turned around and looked at the government, the, uh, the state, and said, well, we have, to, we have to make integration politics from the beginning. So what they're doing, very simple, is using millions of euros for language courses, integration programs, education programs. All this has not been done for guest worker generation. So when the jobs disappeared in the industry, of course, those people had no education, no language skills, <coughs> how could they ever do the other team, you know, in the uh, working force again? But that's kind of a background story. That's actually not what I want to talk about. This is quite a normal story. So I just have a, out of curiosity, can I get up, uh, which is new to me? But basically, going back that far, I would, I would imagine that, uh, and from Berlin, that this may be entirely based on uh, West German, uh, the background, and one question is, how does it uh, relate to activists in, in West Germany? And second, to what extent has uh, that whole idea and movement integrated also uh, the former East German? Yeah. Uh, extremely interesting question. I mean, obviously, I, mean, I didn't mention it, but it's true. This is a West German phenomenon. Um, those people are guest worker, you know, not all of them. It's mixed, mixed backgrounds, <coughs> kind of ethnically German background with part of the Kanaka attack movement as well. They don't look for heritage, for backgrounds. But still, obviously, looking at numbers, a huge amount of those people involved had a kind of background from guest worker generation. Right. That would be a West German phenomenon. They were living in West Berlin and or coming to West Berlin. And, and some of them, actually also some of the people in the Wallows Maninstraße group around there would come from West German cities like the Ruhrgebiet and whatever, who also had strong numbers of guest worker population. So it's not like, <clears throat> it's not like whole German phenomenon. Um, interesting, the story is, I don't think, so far, as far as I can see, that they really reach out for East Germany at the moment, former East Germany. I, I don't think they're the same. There are different discussions in East Germany. There are a lot of things lacking, at, you know, civilization processes, discussions, so it's the same, uh, so decades. Um, what is happening, though, in, in Gorky Theater, <coughs> and also in the still exists, um, very much reaching out for East Europe, which is very interesting. I mean, there, can, there have been like about, about three million immigrants coming from, from East Europe after 1990 to Germany. And they have been children now, they have been, you know, experiences, and they are extremely much included in all those things. So it's not like a Turkish, Greek, or whatever guest work group. It's really manifold, you know, it's really, it's, it's different people's different backgrounds, including people from villages in East Germany, but they would kind of be part of the West Berlin, West Germany theater scene at the moment. So I think that's an interesting point, how they actually kind of reach out to the rest of Germany. I don't know what they actually do. But um, Germany is still very much dominated by, uh, by West Germany. Approaches, it still is. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, let me just go back to this. And, and the one thing I was saying that, that there was integration, but time is a bit wrong. Um, but, but there was a, the first attempt, the academic reception was about reading them as post migrant figures. This has been rejected quite fast in the academic discourse was the beginning in 2010 when Ilias Naker, Fota and others said, oh, well, we're talking about second generation here. Mm -hmm. Then people started to ask, well, if you talk about second generation, what do we win with the new label then? And we can just call them second generation immigrants. Why do we call them post migrants? What do we win here? And so there was a kind of movement inside the academic discussions. There were actually groups founded discussions of things like in academic, you know, professors. 
So they were saying like we have to broaden the perspective. And I personally think it's only then when it becomes interesting. Broadening the expected perspective means that we do not use anymore in the circles post-migration or post-migrant as a figure for the second generation immigrant. We're broadening the perspective in two directions, in the what people call the post-migrant perspective, analytical perspective, which is kind of taken away from subjectivities from person and having as a research academic perspective on society. And the second term would be the term of the post-migrant society that Nadia Fogotan gave Nadia Fogotan kind of changed position on this. She started out, as I said, talking about the second generation immigrants as post-migrants. She's not doing it anymore. She's been convinced by all the others. So she, she would kind of reject this. Everybody in this discussion today rejects those kind of views. Maybe not everybody, but nearly everybody rejects the views of, of post-migrant as second, uh, second generation. Because what they're doing now, what we are doing, and my research group as well, is that we're trying to, to use the term in a broader perspective, taking the perspective away from, from the focus on one group, on migrants, post-migrants, on their experience, and discuss the whole society in this matter, out from a post-migrant perspective. I will, <coughs> I will shorten a little bit, I mean, I have to shorten a little bit here, but, but I, will, I will go into one methodological discuss, discussion, which I think personally is, is kind of the heart of the whole thing. Um, this is a discussion about microontology. Microontology is a term that uh, Regina Reimhardt, uh, professor at, at uh, Humboldt University as well, um, Regina Reimhardt has, has labeled the term, has coined the term uh, microontology as a critique against tendencies in, in migrant research, uh, you know, research on migrants, exactly because they say what we're doing is reproducing a picture that we're always kind of making research on a specific group in society. So I'll give you some quotes from her. Um, she's referring to Anemia Klick-Schiller, uh, methodological ethnicity discussions, uh, like kind of a methodological level, use concept of ethnicity to describe things. And then what we're doing is uh, mainly in empirical research is looking at specific groups, how do they perform in society. And of course the critique here is that when we look at specific groups, how they perform, then we reinvent, reproduce the, the very notion that those groups are different from the rest of society. So we kind of build the demarcation lines that we actually want to break down. Uh, so I give you some quotations on this. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, let's have to find the starting point here. Um, <clears throat> she said, I mean, what she basically said, Regina Remmel, is that, that the problem is that even though we in our days, of course, perceive migrant worlds, I mean, the migrant out there, as hybrid, diverse, <coughs> diasporic identities, I mean, we are not so stupid anymore that we say, like, this is just the ethnic Turk, you know, nobody will say this. This is diverse hybridity and, you know, and, and different belongings and so on, of course. Um, but she said, even though we do this, and we means migration research here, <coughs> um, even though, I mean, while we describe migrant life worlds as highlighted, as, as especially dynamic and mobile, they remain fixed on the periphery, on a special research area outside the ethnical unmarked immobile model and majority society. The underlying problem, she says, is that the migration research is often understood merely as a research about migrants, producing a microontology that is capable of little more than repeatedly illustrating and reproducing itself. A microontology, microontology that at the same time plays its part in constructing its supposed counterpart, the national society of immobile white non-migrants. And she concludes, at least continues here, what is lacking is not yet more research about migration, but a migration-based perspective to generate new insights into the constructed areas of society and culture. I understand this shift in a perspective as a fundamental change towards a post-migrant post -migrant migration research. What this, requires, what this requires in the first place is three appropriate research domains, well, they have to redefine research domains that systematically transgress the bounds of the cultural, culturalized, ethnicized migrant worlds to enter the yet untouched migration society, majority society and institutions. Well, uh, kind of stumbling with the English, English language here. But what's at the point here, I made it before, as she said, as long as we continue to make migration research as research on the other, on the migrant, we'll reproduce the picture we have 
on the process of othering. So we have to open the perspective on society as such. And this is what post-migrant research um, mainly, go, mainly kind of seeks to deliver. The post-migrant research that Nato Fortan is, then, among others, is focusing on is exactly doing this. She is saying now, in the last years, she said, we have to go away from singling out <coughs> migrants and the others as a specific group. What we have to do is to take the look on the society as such and to discuss the processes, struggles, and conflicts in societies influenced by migration, of course. What Nika Fogotan and her, her team is doing is publishing a couple of big reports, uh, big, big reports, um, Deutschland Postmigrantisch 1, 2, 3, Schleswig-Holstein Postmigrantisch, Berlin Postmigrantisch. So they make kind of studies on how kind of the society as such kind of relates to issues of migration and, and othering and ever, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> So it's important here to, to stress that post migrant societies, and the way Fortan uses this, um, does not have overcome conflicts with struggles for recognition and equality, I think. So it's not kind of an utopian, harmonic state we're dealing with. On the opposite, the perspective on post migrant societies would be to get the focus on the struggles, conflicts inside society as a such, um, <clears throat> without kind of reducing it to one specific. Um, specific part of society. Obviously, the whole thing is then about breaking down the demarcation line between micro and non micro And of course, the post micro then refers to a temporal dimension, saying like, well, we have to understand that migration is not something coming as an exception now and kind of changing everything. Migration has always been there. So the post would then refer to, of course, an historical dimension, one of it. That's why I would use the term post-migration, by the way. Migration is something that always been there. Like it has always been as a part of, uh, of our societies. And so we cannot even understand society if we don't understand, if we kind of exclude the dimension, meaning that all the society is built on migration already. That also means that new migration movements are just normalities that we always are dealing with in post-migrant societies, with all different conflicts and problems and everything. This is, of course, a small shift in perspective, but I would see decisive shift. Because it's not kind of saying we have a stable, sedentary, weak group of homogeneous, Danish, white, whatever, um, who has to deal with the other coming from outside. But the V-group as such has been redefined here. We're talking about that the V-group from the beginning is diverse through migration movements. And that means that the challenges, the struggles we're dealing with, the conflicts we're dealing with, are inside a diverse V-group and not a problem between the V-group and the other. So that means, of course, taking the next step in this would mean that the integration logic people would say, would be rejected in those groups. Of course, integration in the old-fashioned term would, would be something that we have to deny. And that wouldn't say that people should not integrate. But the logic of integration in its traditional form would presuppose that we have a weak group who has not to do anything, and the other group who has to make the integration work. So the other coming from outside has to integrate in what already exists as a kind of normative, whatever you call it, weak group. So they would say, if we talk about, some, some in the field would say we have completely get lost, you know, throw this term away, don't talk about integration anymore, it's really a failure. Others would say, nay, now we have to redefine it. We have to re redefine integration and open it for, for a kind of a complex mechanism where everybody in society is involved in integration processes um, and not, again, singling out one group, not coming back to some kind of microontology where the other out there has to do the integration work. Obviously, you can see at least those of you living in Denmark and also Germany, by the way, um, you can, you can easily see that, that this is on a political level when we talk about political discourse that is not yet accepted, so to speak. I mean, today, like everything is about in political discourse, it's about how the other out there, the immigrant and descendant and descendant and descendant, how do they integrate in our wonderful, perfect Danish society? And obviously, this is kind of challenging the whole concept behind it and saying we have to get rid of this logic behind it. We have to understand that the weak group is already diverse and those people have to integrate a part of the weak group. So we have to find solutions together how to deal with each other. That means, of course, that we have to redefine all the questions of color, racism, and everything. I mean, not redefine racism, but we have to redefine the struggles behind it. We have to understand that kind of people of color would be a normal part of our post migrant societies, obviously. I mean, it's kind of a clear point, but in politics it's not clear. In public discourse it's not clear. That's where they're kind of pushing there. Well, I had some other points here, but I, I just, you know, time is up, I think, more or less. I can feel like uh, 
I give you one quotation here, which is somewhat more an empirical, not a perspective discussion. Um, it's Esther Kutschik. Esther Kutschik is part of the Gorky Forum. She's director of the Gorky Forum. The Gorky Forum is part of the Gorky Theater in Berlin. Once they try to get together, build an interface between art and academic political discourses. And she's the one in head of this kind of group inside the Gorky Theater. It is wrong person is great. And, <clears throat> and she once gave a, gave a speech, uh, I don't know speech, but the one speech I want to, the lecture I want to refer to, um, was kind of published in, in Zeit and whatever in Germany. <clears throat> it's called on, on the Courage of Having No Fear, from Mut Keine Angst zu haben. She started out telling that when she was invited by the Zeit Forum, whatever, you know, you know the, 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 the weekly newspaper, the Zeit, like she was invited with a speech. But what, what I want to do now, what I wanted to do, she told, was of course giving, giving a speech on something else. She wanted to give a speech on the experience of marginalization, of racism, of whatever, xenophobia, and, and kind of talking representation politics. And then she said, now actually I don't want to speak about this anymore. Because if I do speak about this, then you see me as a representative of a minority group again, claiming anything. And that would again reaffirm the whole concept of, you know, othering and us and them. So I'm not going to speak about this, she said. Even so, of course, she would say I have Turkish background and whatever, and of course I'm kind of proud of it and whatever. But, but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, so she then talked about the new complexity. And like everybody has talked about complexity for years, so complexity is nothing new. But she said there's a complexity in relation to, um, to the discussion about migration, non-migration, all those things. And this complexity is not yet acknowledged, it's not yet recognized. What we are, in public discourse at least, uh, seeing as that, that uh, demarcation line, I mean, the distinction between migrant and non-migrant seems to be an explanation for things going on in the world. Like, this is the explanation line we're using. And she said that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We have to kind of redefine those things. And I'll just give you some a quotation here, quite long quotation from here, and then kind of stop and, you know, open for discussion. Um, obviously, one point in the discussion could be, I would feel like, how this concept and how this thing, what we are doing in our group, you know, gets an inter- cross-disciplinary approach in it. I mean, this is social sciences, humanities, and I could even say natural sciences coming together in this kind of thing. It's kind of obvious that that's where we are meeting in this field. So I'll give you this quotation, um, <clears throat> which is yeah, just a picture of this too. The distinctions and conflicts no longer run, or run along the old proven demarcation lines right versus left, migrant versus non-migrant, down versus above. The lines of conflicts, as we know them, are more and more dissolving. It becomes more difficult to recognize the antagonism. Gegensätze, he said. Suddenly, left-wing intellectuals want to reverse the double citizenship. Suddenly, migrants can also be Nazis and run through a Munich shopping center to assassinate Turks. This is a kind of anecdote to refer to, which was happening, I think it was last year in, in Germany, when a um, person with Iranian background would define himself as an Aryan, you know, Iran area, that's kind of Nazi terminology, um, and going around and killing the Turks because they were foreigners, and he would be an Aryan, you know, whatever. Um, an interesting discussion about the whole event happening in Munich. It's not labeled as terrorism because, of course, it, uh, that's right wing, so we don't label it as terrorism. But interesting, of course, the migration background plays in here, and when you discuss with people from the Iranian community about it, a lot of researchers, Fogutan, here in Asparan, Hitzi, Asari Shavif, they all have Iranian background, many of them. They kind of figure out that there's an actually a problem going on in the community, um, you know, defining themselves as superior to other immigration groups and so on. A different story, but that's what she refers to here. So, sorry for the thought. Suddenly, left wing intellectuals want to reverse the double citizenship. Suddenly, migrants can also be Nazis and run some Munich shopping center to assassinate Turks. Suddenly, conservatives start to help refugees. The dome post in Cologne turns off the light when Pegida demonstrates in Dresden. My grandmother began to curse when she meets a woman with a headscarf on the street. And she can curse my grandmother. My Turkish taxi driver is afraid that refugees will take his work away from him. My feminist neighbor is wearing a headscarf and subscribes to Missy magazine. The conservative suburban family smears sandwiches for refugees at the train station. Conservative business associations are working to ban deportations of refugees who are in education, and so on. So the whole point here, of course, is making this that when we have this complexity in the world, then we cannot explain this complexity against old-fashioned um, 
concepts like migrant or non-migrant or different distinction lines. It's much more complex here. So what she is saying, actually referring back to Panaka Tak, um, indirectly would then be Haltung statt Herkunft. We have to talk about attitudes toward our open society, open society, and that would be kind of independent from where you come from. It's not about Herkunft, but about Haltung, it's not about origin, but about attitude, position. So I stop here. Thank you for the patient. Thank you so much. I think we still have the time for some uh, questions and short remarks. Uh, Francesco? I, I find it very fascinating. Sorry, it was so oh, yes. I find it very fascinating and interesting. Uh, being a migrant, migrant myself here, so technically in the States here, uh, I recognize a number of these uh, things you just said, right? Um, but there's also, as you say at the end, right, there's also part that there is a society already there and you enter in a society. Right? So as a migrant, you're actually entering another society, so which also means you yourself have to kind of be ready to accept you're not a migrant, which is not easy to do, right? So I think it, you're seeing it from the perspective of the, of the local place. But there is also the migrant himself or herself that comes to a new society. And that yeah. is the difference. So how open they are to that. Uh, and that is also a discussion that's not typically not incredibly taken. And the second thing is that uh, not many people have experienced abroad from the society you get into. So there is a, a huge level of being provincial because you actually never left the place. So yeah. you don't know what it means being a migrant either. So there are these two things which are typically never really addressed, right? What does it mean being a migrant? Because you never experienced that. What? Nor what is from the migrants who actually adjust to the society you get in. So how, how do you see that? Uh, I mean, mainly I see, of course, the adjustment process is going on, obviously. When people coming from outside with different uh, backgrounds and kind of socialization and languages and everything, of course, there's an adjustment process going on. I think the main thing here is whether you believe that this adjustment process is is kind of going towards a pre-existing homogeneous group that you enter. And this is actually the thing that they kind of kind of struggle with. I mean, they're saying, this is not so easy. I mean, this group in itself is diverse and, and built on migration, which is kind of a simple point, you know, it's not, not, not a big thing. But the simple point changes the perspective. And as I said, for me in a decisive way, and that also means like when 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 you talk about to, when you talk with Syrian refugees in Berlin at the moment, I mean they are part of the society, and even though they're part of society with language skills which would be different from others, they're part of it. And and post-migrant society perspective puts them try to kind of locate what's going on and and kind of you know interactions, conflicts, um, you know meetings, whatever, but but not singling out like there's a one and here's a group and then we have to see how the adjustment going on. Like, like when I visit recently Berlin, I come from Berlin myself, so I have migrant experience. I, I know process of othering very good. I mean, as a German in Denmark, you're very much confronted with not being a, Den a Dane, uh, very much. And, and then you try to overtake it, internalize it, and reject Denmark and everything. Now I was happy about Danish football once, I I'm not anymore. <laughs> I never come back. I mean, they, they kind of destroyed it for you me. You mean 1982? Yeah, but it's because I always told me I don't belong. I mean, I always heard I don't belong, you know? And not anymore now, maybe, but I heard it for years. And so you start to build your own resistance. I understand people, even, I even understand radicalization processes yeah, somehow. Yeah. They're part of othering process, part, not only, but it's true. But, um, but, but when I recently was back in Berlin, you know, sitting together with some refugees, actually, Syrian refugee, Af Af Afghan refugee, my Danish wife, uh, uh, Italian former lover of my wife, and whatever, you know, sitting together. I mean, the ones who were best in speaking German besides me and my family would be the refugees from Syria. <laughs> the Afghan would not be able to speak anything, he just arrived. The Italian ex-lover would not be able to understand anything, not even English. <laughs> no, my wife being married I'm to Italian, me. I'm Italian, so I need to be. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Great person, yeah, I would not understand anything. <laughs> you know, my, my wife, after 20 years together with me, would not speak a single word German, but understand everything. My son would, you know, whatever. You could continue. Yeah, this group no, was, I, was so diverse in it that you cannot just say there's adjustment going on by the refugees. Mm. The refugees were more integrated than, you know, than other people who had been in contact with Germany for 20 years. And of course, in other perspectives you take, then they would not be integrated. I mean, of course, there would be kind of different perspectives what you take. They talk with my, my Turkish-born you know, brother-in-law about the experience of being hidden in school. I mean, you're beaten up in school. Experience I don't have. I grew up in Germany. The Turkish brother-in-law for me, Turkish-born, now German brother-in-law, it's a Syrian refugee. They talk about a common experience that I don't have. Of course there are differences. But those differences can be discussed and opened up without saying, you are there and I'm here. And no, you have to come to me. 
you know, it's crawling up to complexity. That's actually what it's about. And it's opening interesting questions and not even solutions. I don't, maybe it's the first time in my career as academics I don't have answers. You know, normally you kind of find some answers. Oh, it's here where I want to go. I don't have answers. I mean, it's really an open field. I think it's great. It's really, really great. Several uh, comes now. Yeah, yeah. Quick one. How did uh, Ballhaus Nonnenstraße and Gorky influence the Leipzig theatre scene? Because in Leipzig you have the more classic division line between left and right, and classic you are different, we are the sex zones. Uh, so, uh, do you have, you have any data on that? Actually, I have no idea, but I guess a lot of people who know about it. I, I just don't know about the Leipzig theatre scene. Theater scene. I, I know, of course, that this would be seen as leftist avant-gardistic theater. And, and obviously, that would also be a demarcation line again that some people would say this is just, you know, leftist avant-garde theater. Don't go there. But there still is one of the major institutions about the theater. Small theater, but still. So it's not, it's in the Unter den Linden, you know, just beside the Deutsche Historische Museum. That's a huge institution, center of Berlin, center of the power of Germany, so to speak. So it's not marginalized anymore. But I don't know exactly how it continues in, you know, different, mm. Leipzig would be one example. Also different other areas in Germany. I don't know exactly how the kind of development is. So they had huge influence because they break up the boundaries, the barriers against, you know, the main institutions. They managed to come on the front page easily, um, front page uh, of Theater Heute, which is the main, main journal, you know. Uh, Gorky Theater has been in 14 and 16 elected as Germany's Theater of the Year by those critics, you know. This is amazing. Just two years after they take over, two years they have been chosen for the most important theater in whole Germany. They, they broke the boundaries, the, the barriers, you know, they came into this institution. But of course, the question would then be how would it be in the other field? And there's, of course, there's one danger in it, would be that there would be kind of the, the model everybody can point at. While diversity work, people of color and theater, oh, we have the Gorky, you know, and the Ballhaus is still existing, doing good work, you know. So we don't have to do anything else in the other theaters or whatever, cultural institutions. That's a real problem. Yeah. And we have to, we have to remember, uh, <laughs> have to remember in Germany until recently, it was still nearly not unseen that people of color would play Shakespeare or whatever, you know, uh, you know, Kanglia or whatever, um, which would be maybe different in the UK, for example. But in Germany, it was really, you have to break into that and make sure that, that you can have different roles with different colors and whatever, you know, that's uh, they're doing it. Sorry. Yeah, very uh, short questions and very short answers, Patrick. I want to ask you about this argument that you came back to a couple of times, this claim that, um, the methods of studying for migration can't reinforce the problem that they're supposed to solve. Um, it's, uh, there is a theory of knowledge that I think you're relying on that I'd like it if you could try to explain. Because that particular premise, there would be lots of other fields of study where that wouldn't make any sense. No one thinks that my methods of studying stars reinforce the existence of stars. <laughs> By studying the oceans, I don't reinforce the existence of oceans. Uh, so why is it the case that when I'm studying, well, maybe, maybe you want to dispute that. So why is it the case that um, the ways I study migration are so susceptible to reinforcing uh, the uh, reinforcing yeah. the, the um, why, why is the way I study it um, and the thing that I'm studying permeable in this instance? Yeah, I, I think maybe one should dispute the, the major thing you said. Okay. It's not kind of problematic in other uh, situations. I think what, what we, at least when you come from humanities and partly social research, I mean, I think background in social sciences, so kind of I'm being in between, but I think you understand quite fast how concepts shape the world, you know? And even though I would agree on this water out there and the ocean and so on, of course, the way we speak about the ocean also in research shapes the reality, the way we're looking at the world. I think we could agree on this at some point. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, in a, um, well, well yeah. finish your back. But just to, just to make the, the argument here is that, of course, when you go into fields like social constructions of identities, like migrants, non migrants, and so on, then, of course, you're shaping a, a lived reality and political reality for people. I mean, this is. Uh, this is maybe, maybe also different to natural sciences and talking about the ocean and salt and whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about that people are labeled to being something for their whole life. And, and growing up in, I mean, those people, Sherman Lang, of growing up in Germany, I mean, at least you came as a child, then being socialized in Germany, and all the time hearing you don't belong, you're a foreigner and so on. That's through the label of the migrant. And then we go to the methodological level, on a research level, and Regina Remmelt, uh, among others, would argue that, well, we're doing exactly the same as researchers. 
doing exactly the same by singling out a, a preconcept. Uh, we're having a preconcept of the migrant, and in this migrant, we already kind of put a lot of different you know, values into it, what this migrant is about, and then we go out there and define the group and look at it. And so we reproduce. The interesting part of this is, of, of course, when you do this, microntology, as she calls it, um, and I think that's a political, that's just an agenda to break it up because people are kind of suffering under those labels, you know. And so, of course, it's getting into methodological then. But when you, when, you, when you do it, when you do microntology, then you have to define who's the migrant, which is extremely interesting. I mean, I tried to compare Germany and Denmark. Extremely funny stuff. Try to compare, you know, just a simple point on which country is more diverse, you know. Diverse is so great. Yeah, I, nobody can tell me. I cannot tell. The statistics saying that in, in Germany, every fifth person, like 20, 22%, has migration background. In Denmark, 7%. So, oh, great. Germany is more diverse. It's nonsense because they're using different definitions. And when you try to compare the definitions of who has a migration background, you understand that Danish definitions is much more kind of, um, you're much easier part of Denmark than in Germany. So I, I did kind of the idea of comparing, because nobody, I, I mean, I was in contact with the Statistics Bureau in Denmark to tell me, if you use the German definition, what would be the result in Denmark would be? If you use, as they said, I cannot tell you. We cannot use it if we have no numbers on it. We are, they accept the different definitions. They cannot use the numbers. They cannot give me the numbers. So I did kind of very simple. Went to the school of my son, two schools actually, in, in Estopo, some of you may know, white area, you know. I looked at the German definition in the class. I know the parents somehow, you know, looked at the background. Danish definition would give me like 3%, or like one, one out of 30 more or less, has a migration background. German definition, the same people would be like 40%, 35% to be honest, migration background. Completely different numbers because different definitions. I did the same thing in a small school in, in outside, you know, on the countryside we're living at the moment. Same thing, 10% 10, 10 from a Danish perspective, 45% from a German perspective on a small island outside the metropole, you know. Completely different definitions. So when you start to use microntology, talking about the migrant out there, then you use definitions as constructing the world who the migrant is. Because migrant would be the descendant, even the descendant of the descendant in some definitions. So you have to define it. And then, of course, when you define it, then the results of your, that's kind of, I guess, accepted. The, the result of your, uh, your, your research is, of course, bound to the definition you used in the beginning. I mean, when you, when you kind of include like half of the population with migration background, then obviously they won't quite match the rest of the population. When you single out a little group, then obviously you have a lot of problems in this group. I mean, it's kind of, you know, whatever. There, there's consequences how you define those groups. So people like Regina Omid will see, well, this is a political problem we're dealing with, and it's an academic problem. We cannot use those definitions. I mean, at least not so easily. Well, friends and <laughs> colleagues, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark, for an excellent uh, lecture. Thank you for all your enthusiastic uh, questions. And there are still more, but we, we can't reach it today. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for the lecture.